In this video, I'll be discussing calorimetry. Our objective will be to apply concepts of calorimetry in two different contexts. One under constant volume, so-called BOM calorimetry conditions, and the other in terms of constant pressure or so-called coffee cup calorimetry conditions. If you've looked at a nutrition label, you'll, uh, at least in the US, you'll see the val there's a value listed in terms of calories. If you look at a, a, a nutrition label from another country, like in Europe, you'll just see this listed just as energy. And the values here are given in both kilojoules and kilocalories. Now, how do you think these numbers were generated? How, where do these numbers come from? Why do some foods have more energy stored than others? This is a job for calorimetry, which literally translates into measuring heat. Now, going back to our idea of food, here are two different foods, Cheerios and Cheetos. They both contain different amounts of calories per serving. But how are those numbers determined? The energy stored in food or generated from en uh, any type of chemical reaction can be measured using a bomb calorimeter. Importantly, this type of calorimetry occurs at constant volume. Here's a picture of a bomb calorimeter, and here's a schematic of what it looks like in the inside. The most critical pieces are that there are a sealed, there, there's a sealed bomb with constant volume inside, and this is where the sample to be reacted is placed. For example, if we were trying to figure out how, much, how many calories were in a sample of Cheetos, we'd put our sample of Cheetos into this bomb sample area. What happens is that then the Cheetos undergo a combustion reaction with oxygen, and release heat into the surrounding water area within the calorimeter. The change in temperature is then measured using a thermometer. What we're measuring here is the change in internal energy, and I'll show you why. So in a previous video, we've defined change in internal energy as heat plus work, and we defined work as negative P external delta V. Under constant volume conditions, the change in volume is zero. This means that work is zero. This equation then simplifies into the change in internal energy is equal to QV, where the subscript V signifies the heat transfer is at constant volume. So let's look at the energy exchange occurring within this bomb calorimetry example. Energy is released by the system, and the system is defined as the combustion reaction that occurs within the bomb. For example, burning Cheetos. The energy is then absorbed by the surroundings, which are defined as the water bath around the bomb and the rest of the calorimeter setup. We can then define the heat absorbed by the calorimeter as CCAL, which is the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter setup, this is typically measured in a separate experiment, times delta T, T final minus T initial. If the units of the specific heat of the ca uh, capacity of the calorimeter are in kilojoules per degree Celsius, delta T will also be in degrees Celsius. If we use these units, we get a value of Q of the calorimeter in units of kilojoules. Importantly, the reaction happening inside the bomb is what we're most interested in. To determine that, it will simply be the same magnitude of Q of the calorimeter with the reverse sign. In other words, if heat is being released by the reaction, that heat is being absorbed, right, by the surroundings. Let's do a practice problem here. Try this one on your own by pausing the video, and then I'll show you how to work it out. In this question, we're asked to report Q of reaction. We know that we can calculate or determine Q of the calorimeter, in other words, known as heat of the surroundings, by, and we're given um, the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter to be 5.73 kilojoules per degree Celsius. 
And we know that delta T here, because the temperature inside the calorimeter, inside that water bath, increases by 13 degrees Celsius, we know that delta T is positive 13 degrees Celsius from the perspective of the calorimeter. We can then calculate that Q of the calorimeter is equal to 74 kilojoules. Now you'll notice this is an answer choice, but this is not the heat associated with the reaction. Okay, remember, Q of calorimeter is equal to negative Q of reaction. So to find Q of reaction here, we need to take Q of calorimeter and change the sign. Q of reaction, therefore, is negative 74 kilojoules. That is answer choice B. It's really important to consider the meaning of this negative sign. Remember, the reaction is what's happening inside the bomb, the system. If Q of the system has a negative value, you'll recall from previous videos that this means that heat is being transferred from the system to the surroundings, from the reaction inside of the bomb out into the surrounding calorimeter. So this sign makes rational sense. The second type of uh, calorimetry we'll be discussing today is coffee cup calorimetry. In a previous video, we've discussed that constant pressure conditions uh, or that the heat transfer at constant pressure is equal to the change in enthalpy. We can measure the heat at constant pressure using a coffee cup calorimeter. This is an imperfect but cost-effective method involving two nested styrofoam cups. In the interior of, the, of one of the cups, there's a reaction mixture um, which is being monitored by a, the temperature of which is being monitored by a thermometer. Generally speaking, in this type of calorimetry, the chemical reaction that we're interested in studying occurs in the solution. Typically, a solid is added to a liquid or solution, or two liquids may be added together. In this instance, we define the solution as the surroundings, and we call the heat of the solution Q with the abbreviation SOLN, or you could write Q of solution. We can calculate the heat of the solution using the mass of the solution, the specific heat of the solution, and the temperature change of the solution. These variables are determined or are um, outlined further below. Since we're defining the surroundings as the solution, the system is what we're either adding or dissolving into the solution. What we're generally interested in looking at is the heat of the system, how the system is changing. And we know that this is the, um, the reverse sign of whatever is happening in the surroundings, because generally heat is being transferred either to the system by the surroundings or from the system to the surroundings, depending on the type of chemical reaction we're studying. So in other words, the heat measured in the solution is always the opposite of the reaction. Let's look at this in more detail. We have Q of the solution is equal to mass of the solution times its specific heat times change in temperature, and that's equal to negative Q of the reaction we're studying. As I discussed in a previous video and earlier here, because we're under constant pressure conditions, Q of reaction is equal to the change in enthalpy of the reaction. This is how we can measure the change, in, one of the ways in which we can measure the change in enthalpy of the reaction. I'll do a more in-depth calculation using these ideas in the coffee cup calorimetry practice calculation video. So be sure to watch that one. As a preview to that, let's consider how we can relate the heat transfer to delta H in coffee cup calorimetry. In this example, imagine you add a hot piece of copper to room temperature water. What is the sign of delta H of the copper? Before trying to do any calculations, let's think about this conceptually. If a hot piece of metal is added to room temperature water, 
The metal will cool down and the water will heat up. This means that the heat transfer will occur between the metal and the water, specifically from the metal to the water. Since the metal is cooling down, we would expect the sign of the heat of the metal to become negative and the sign of the heat transfer of the water to become positive. Because of this, delta H of the copper will have a negative value. This is an exothermic process where the copper releases heat into the surrounding water. In this video, we've discussed two different types of calorimetry, constant volume calorimetry and constant pressure calorimetry. I highly encourage practicing calculations and applying practice applying concepts between behind both of these types of calorimetry in more detail. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.